Today, being Easter weekend, brings to a close what is historically known as the Passion Week. Last Sunday, we looked at the triumphal entry, which is where Jesus presents himself uh, to be crucified. He presents himself as Israel's true king. Then we moved to Good Friday, and we looked about at the glorious truth that Jesus went to the cross and absorbed upon himself the wrath that you and I deserve because of our sin. And for those that have placed their faith in Jesus Christ, they are eternally delivered from the wrath of God. This morning, I'd like to bring a message called The Motivating Power of the Resurrection. The Motivating Power of the Resurrection. And rather than look at a narrative account of the resurrection, I want us to look at a passage of scripture that shows us how the reality of our future bodily erection as believers should impact the way we live today. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Our Father and our God, we come before you delighted. Delighted to know that although we are guilty sinners, you have taken away our guilt at the cross. Though we deserve death and eternal punishment, you have resurrected. And for all those that are in you, we too will rise one day. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have accomplished, for your glory and our good. And thank you that you have taken us into that reality, the reality of the gospel. We love you, Lord. We now pray as we look to how the reality of our future should impact the way we live today. We pray that you would move our affections and that you would change the way that we are living our life so that we might bring you more glory and more honor as we await our resurrection. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Four of the world's main religions are based on their founders. Judaism, Buddhism, Islam, and Christianity. Looks like I'm going to have a friend with me all sermon this morning. Of those four religious founders, all four died. In Judaism, Abraham died somewhere between or somewhere around 2000 BC, and he was buried in Hebron. In Buddhism, Buddha died in the 5th or 6th century, and according to tradition, he is said to have died at 80 years old and was cremated. The founder of Islam, Muhammad, died on June 8th, 632 AD, and his body is buried in Medina, and his grave is visited by millions of pilgrims every year. The founder of Christianity, Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, he died in 32 or 33 AD and was buried in Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. Four of the main religions, all of the founders of those four religions have died. So what makes Christianity distinct from other world religions? Well, only the Christian faith claims that our founder was raised bodily and eternally from the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the capstone of the Christian faith. In fact, the great reformer Martin Luther said, the greatest importance attaches to this article of the faith. For where there is no resurrection, we should have neither comfort or hope, and all that Christ has done would be in vain. Calvin said, the resurrection of Christ is the most important article of our faith, the chief point of the gospel, and the main article of religion. Scripture points us to the culmination of our salvation as Christians um, to a bodily resurrection. As believers, we will be bodily resurrected because of our union with Christ. When you come to Christ, you've repented of your sin and placed your faith in Christ. You come into union with Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 20, Paul says, but now Christ has been raised from the dead. And then he says, the first fruits of those who are asleep. 
The word asleep refers to those who have died in faith, and Christ is the first fruits. He is the first among us to rise from the dead. Colossians 1.18 says, He is the head of the body, speaking of Christ the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. Colossians 1.18 is the theme of Revolve Bible Church. A lot of people like to order their lives, God, family, work, but that's not how the Bible says Christians are to order their lives. Christians order their lives by placing Jesus Christ first in everything. Our lives revolve around him. He's first in our family. He's first in our job. He's first in our recreation. Jesus Christ is to have the supremacy in all things. And why? Because he is the firstborn from among the dead. We will follow with him. Peter says in 1 Peter uh, 1, verses 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The resurrection is truly the capstone of our faith. For all those who are justified, all those who are justified will be glorified. Yes, we are forgiven of our sin, but forgiveness is not where the gospel ends. The reality is, is for all those who are in Christ, we are destined for glorification. And the Bible defines glorification as us receiving a glorified body. Our physical bodies will be resurrected and transformed, and we will have physical bodies in heaven for eternity with Christ. This is the hope of the Christian. This life is not all there is. Let me say that again. Easter Sunday, the resurrection reminds us that this life is not all there is. And how does this impact the way we live as Christians? I'm going to say something radical and then I want you to bear with me as we flesh it out. This results and you treating your life now as cheap. Because this life is not all there is, we don't hold on to this life with a death grip. But for us, to live is Christ. But to die is gain. What's happened this year because of the COVID-19 pandemic is that Christians have treated this life as more precious than we should be treating it. I'll try to make that clear in the passages that we'll look at this morning. Would you please turn with me, if you're not already there, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians Chapter 15. Years ago, as a youth pastor, I taught through the book of 1 Corinthians and I titled the series, The Way Church Shouldn't Be. That's a good description of the book of 1 Corinthians. The church of Corinth was fraught with theological and moral problems. A lot of their moral problems stem from their bad theology. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul gives us his uh, theological dissertation on the resurrection of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Christ and the bodily resurrection of believers who will join with him in eternity. Before we jump into our passage this morning, let me give you a little bit of the context of what's going on here in chapter 15. Uh, Paul wrote this chapter because it had been reported to him that there were those in Corinth who denied that Christians will experience a physical bodily resurrection. Notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, notice verse 12. Now, if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? The majority of the people in the church of Corinth were Greeks, and the Greeks of that day believed that people had an immortal soul, but they believed that their bodies were 
a physical prison. So the idea for first century Greeks was that to die and be separated from the body was really to experience bliss. It was to free, be freed from the prison of the body. But in the Jewish mind and in the biblical mindset, uh, the Bible doesn't view the body as an evil thing. In fact, the body's not an evil thing. It will be resurrected and glorified. But in the mind of a first century Jew, uh, Jews believed that Yahweh had created humans to be both material and immaterial, physical bodies and an immortal soul. So the Greek thinking had crept into the church of Corinth and they began to sway back away from a biblical understanding of, of anthropology and embrace this idea that the Greeks had about the body not being important. And this led to them listening to some of these false teachers who argued that there was no such thing as a bodily resurrection. So they found the idea of the resurrection a foolish thing and that began to manifest itself in the life of the church. Their bad theology of a future bad bodily resurrection was in part what led them to embrace a moral living. Now let me just outline this chapter for you. I was tempted this morning to read all 58 verses to you and it would be no trouble for me to do that to you, but you probably want to go home sometime before dinner. But I do want to outline the passage just to give us a, a running start. This is really a tour de force on the doctrine of the resurrection. In verses one and two, Paul presents his introduction. And then in verses three through 11, he gives us the evidence of the resurrection from eyewitness accounts. He then moves in verses 12 through 19 to explain the theological importance of the resurrection. If uh, you don't believe that there's a resurrection, according to Paul in verse 13, you have a false Christology. In verse 14, you have a false ecclesiology. In verse 14b, you have a false soteriology. In verse 15, you have a false missiology. And you have a false eschatology in verse 18. In other words, Paul goes through in verses 12 through 19 and connects many of the main doctrines of the Christian faith to the resurrection. And so to deny the resurrection is really to deny the Christian faith. Then he moves in verses 20 through 28 to describe the order of resurrection. And then in our text, verses 29 through 34, the practical impact of the resurrection on today's living. Then he moves from there in verses 35 through 41, and he gives evidence for the resurrection from nature. He gives evidence from botany, biology, and astronomy. And just as a aside, look at verses 35 through 38. In verse 35, Paul says, but someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body will they come? You fool. Now, stop right there and just think about this for a minute. There are those today who will say, how could it be that something could be resurrected? What's Paul's response to people that think that way? You fool. Why? Well, notice what he says. That which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which is to be, but a bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. Verse 38, but God gives it a body just as he wish, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. Now think about this for a minute. When a seed on a plant is attached to a plant, is that seed alive or dead? It's alive. But when a seed breaks away from the plant, it ceases to be what? Alive. It's the cells are no longer replicating. Seeds are dead. We knew that, right? That's why we can store seeds for a very long time because they're not living organisms. But then you put a seed in the ground and you water it and give it sun and you give it food, what happens? That dead piece of the plant that was once alive, what? Resurrects. Every single plant you've ever seen is a testimony to you about the reality of a physical bodily resurrection. Every single plant that is outside has died and came back to life. This is why Paul says it's foolish to think that things can't be resurrected because there's evidences 
everywhere. And he gives other evidence as well. Then he goes on and he gives us a glimpse of what our resurrected bodies will be like in verses 42 through 49. Let's read those verses quickly together now. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in a perishable body and is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor and it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body and it is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul and the last Adam became a living, a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. The first man is from the earth, earthly, and the second man is from heaven, as is the earthly, so also are those who are earthly, and as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthly, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now, quickly, I'd like to just point out several realities about our resurrected bodies. Here's how it works, and we'll return to this before the message is over this morning. But when a Christian dies, when anyone dies, they are instantly separated from their physical bodies. When we go to funerals, people's bodies are in the ground. Maybe you've seen a dead body before, and when somebody sees a dead body, the first response is typically, that's not that person. It's just a shell. It's a body. That's because upon death, the soul, the immaterial part of us, is separated from the material part of us. For the believer, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. As soon as the Christian dies, we close our eyes on this world and we immediately open our eyes in the presence of our Savior. We are with the Lord spiritually, and theologians call that the intermediate state. Then, at the rapture, those that have died before the rapture, we will be caught up and uh, resurrected physically with the Lord and transformed in the twinkling of an eye. We will be given new bodies at that time. Now, everyone will be resurrected. We'll get to that. But it's important to think through what will our resurrected bodies be like? And Paul tells us a couple things about what's coming for the believer. He says in verses 38 through 41 that they'll be different than our bodies are now. Then in verse 41, notice in verse 41, the second half, he says, and another the glory of the stars and the stars differ from stars in glory. They will be diverse. At the transfiguration, if you remember, we looked at that not too long ago, Peter was able to distinguish between Moses, Elijah, and Jesus in Matthew chapter 17. You remember when Peter saw Jesus and then as he was transfigured, literally that means he was changed into his state of glory. Then immediately appeared with him was Moses and Elijah. And as soon as that occurred, Peter knew that it was Moses and Elijah, but yet they were in a glorified state. So when we are glorified, we will still have our own individual identities. Our bodies are so earthly, but they will be spiritual their actual physical body as well. That's the language Paul uses in this text, spiritual. But they're also diverse. We, we will know as we are known, or we'll, we will be known rather as we know. Then in verse 42, he says our bodies will be imperishable. That is, that they will not decay. They are sown perishable, but raised imperishable. We'll never get sick. Uh, our bodies will never rot. We'll never get old. We'll never wrinkle. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. That's good news. Silver saints, can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> Our bodies will also be glorious, according to verse 43. And the Greek noun for glory is doxa, and here it refers to the quality of being splendid or being remarkable in appearance. Notice verse 43. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. I don't know about you, but sometimes I look in the mirror and I see some things that I think are unattractive. But when I get a glorified body, there will be absolutely nothing unattractive about us. They're raised in glory. Not only are they uh, glorified bodies, glorious bodies, but notice also verse 33, they are powerful bodies. They are powerful bodies. In verse 43, they are raised in power. We are not going to be subject or bound by 
physical limitations. You remember when Jesus rose bodily in a glorified state, he was able to appear and reappear in different places almost in an instant. He wasn't bound by physical limitations that we are currently bound by. We'll be raised in power. We'll also be spiritual according to verse 44. And that is really just a way to say that we will have bodies that are suited for heaven. In Luke 20 verses 34 through 36, Jesus said to them, the sons of this age um, marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to the age and the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage for they cannot die anymore because they are like angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. Now there, Jesus says that there's no more marriage in heaven. Despite what the Mormons teach, there is no marriage in heaven. Why is there no marriage in heaven? Because there's no need to procreate. There will be a fixed number of people in heaven, and those fixed number of people in heaven will never decay. They will always be there for eternity. There is no need to procreate and have children because there is a fixed number. Revelation 13, 7 through 8 says, It was also given to him to make war with the saints. Uh, and to overcome them and the authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. All who dwell on earth will worship him. Everyone whose name, listen to this, has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the lamb who has been slain. From the foundation of the world, everyone who has not been written in the name of the book of the lamb. Everyone in heaven has, is there because their name was written in the book of the lamb. And it was written from the foundations of the world. There is a fixed number of people. According to verses 45 through 49 of 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that uh, we will be like Jesus. And then he closes the book by talking about the mystery of the resurrection in verses 50 to 57, and then actually gives his conclusion rather in verse 58. Look at verse 58 of chapter 15 with me. This is the conclusion of the matter. Therefore, after this tour de force of looking at all that pertains to the resurrection of Christ, the evidence of the resurrection of Christ, uh, what we will be like in our resurrected bodies. He concludes with this statement. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Three things, steadfast. You're faithful to do what God has called you to do. You're steadfast and you're immovable in the truth. You don't move away from the hope of the resurrection and you're always abounding in the work of the Lord. In light of the resurrection, you're always abounding in the work of the Lord. And then he adds this encouragement knowing that your toil is not in what? Vain. Now let's go to our passage this morning and read those verses together. Verses 29 through 34. Otherwise, what will those who are baptized for the dead, if the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, that by boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. Become sober-minded as you ought and stop sinning for some have no knowledge of God and I speak this to your shame. Now, let me just give you a footnote on verse 29 because we're not gonna cover that this morning. Verse 29 is a strange verse in the New Testament. And in fact, it's considered one of the most difficult verses to interpret. There are over a hundred interpretations of verse 29. I don't have time to go through all the interpretations for you this morning, but I believe that the two most plausible are this. First, that this verse could be taken at face value. Now, look at the verse again. Otherwise, uh, what will those who are baptized for the dead, if the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized for them? Paul's saying, look, if there's no such thing as a resurrection, as a future bodily resurrection, then why are people baptized for the dead? What is Paul talking about here? What does it mean to be baptized for the dead? Well, Paul could be just referring to a practice that they were doing and in referring to it, he's not advocating for it 
nor affirming it. He's just simply showing them the inconsistency of their theology. In other words, hey, you're believing that there's no such thing as a bodily resurrection, then why in the world are you baptizing the dead? Now again, that's not to affirm baptizing the dead or advocate for it. He's just showing them their hypocrisy and their inconsistency. Another possible interpretation is that baptism here refers to salvation. Today, when someone is, comes to Christ, they tend to not get baptized right away. In biblical times, to come to Christ was to be baptized. And so the idea of being baptized was synonymous with conversion and coming to salvation. But then also notice that the preposition huper, which is the word for, do you see that in verse 29? Otherwise, what will those who are baptized for huper? Do you see that word for? For the dead, if the dead are not raised at all, why then are they baptized? And then same uh, preposition again, for them. Now, that word has a range of meaning. It can be translated a lot of ways. One of the ways it can be translated is because of. So with those two thoughts in mind, look at the text again. Let me read it. Otherwise, what will those uh, who are saved because of the dead? And then notice as the verse goes on, if the dead are not raised at all, why then are they saved because of them? In other words, Paul could be saying that there are people in the church who died because of persecution and their lives were so inspiring to others that people were converted after their deaths because their lives were so inspiring. That is a possible interpretation. And so Paul's argument would then be, um, why are people coming to Christ after these people died if there's no hope for those people that have died? Now, if you have a study Bible, you can look up that verse and dig in a little bit more, but let's get back to the main topic for us this morning. Again, I'd like to remind you that the title of my message is The Motivating Power of the Resurrection. How should the reality of our future bodily resurrection impact the way that we live today? Number one, you can write this down. I got two points for you. Here we go. Number one, a willingness to embrace hardship and take risks for Christ. How should the reality of our future resurrection impact the way we live today? A willingness to embrace hardship and take risks for Christ. Paul's point is this. If death is the end and there's no such thing as the resurrection, then what is the point in embracing danger and taking risks for Christ? Notice verses 30 and 32, verses 30 through 32. Why are we also in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. If from human motives I fought with wild uh, beasts at Ephesus, what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. So Paul now moves to talk about the reality of the resurrection from his own present experience. What Paul's revealing to us here is his motivation to endure hardship and suffering and take risks for the sake of Christ. Paul is uh, peeling back his uh, chest, if you would, and showing us his heart. He's saying, this is why I'm willing to count my life now as cheap Because I know that this life is not all there is. That's why I'm willing to place myself in danger. That's why Paul says, metaphorically speaking, I die daily. That's why Paul says, I don't just party, but I willingly suffer for the cause of Christ in this world because this world is not all there is. Because this life is not all there is, believers are willing to risk their lives for the sake of Christ. Listen, church, I have news for you. The call of Christ is to come and die. The call of Christ is to come and die. You see, we as Christians, we've been deceived because of false teaching and other ideas about life. We have been deceived into thinking that the purpose of our life is our pleasure. Pleasure. 
I have news for you. That's not the purpose of your life. And if you think that's the purpose of your life, then you're not thinking about the reality of the future bodily resurrection. You see, the purpose of our life is not our pleasure. The purpose of our life is to glorify God. Despite what Joel Osteen says, this is not our best life now. Our best life will be then. And because our best life is then, we embrace hardship, risk, and suffering now. Let's do a little Bible study just to put this in our minds, and we'll come back to this passage and look at what Paul's saying about it. But turn with me to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Just a couple quick places. In Luke chapter 9, Jesus says something staggering in verse 23. Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus says this, and he said to them all, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? To come to Christ is to deny self. That's repentance. When we place our faith in Christ, we turn from self. We turn from the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. We repent. We we make a 180 and we place our faith in Christ. But as believers, we live a lifestyle of cross-bearing. Notice verse 23 again. Jesus says that if anyone wishes to come after me, if you want to follow him, you've got to deny yourself. Then notice he says, take up his cross daily. What does that mean to take up your cross daily? Well, it means to put a necklace on it. No, I'm just kidding. That's not what it means. Back in the first century, this phrase, take up your cross, it would have been understood to mean pick up your mode of death. It would have been the same way of saying, pick up your lethal injection. Pick up your electric chair. The idea here, the cross in the first century was widely understood to be the method of execution. Jesus is literally saying, embrace your own death. And how often? Daily. You see, to serve Christ is going to require danger and risk. It's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you everything. To follow Christ is to pay a price Why in the world do we do that? The answer? Because we are looking forward to our bodily resurrection. Turn to Luke chapter 14. And if that's not hard enough words, Jesus takes it to a whole nother level. In Luke chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me And does not hate his own father and his own mother and his wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yet even his own life, he cannot be my what? And then he says it again. Whoever does not carry his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. The word hate, it's a Hebraism. It it means to love less. You got to love Jesus Christ more than your wife. You got to love Jesus Christ more than your husband. You gotta love Jesus Christ more than your kids. You gotta love Jesus Christ more than your job. You gotta love Jesus Christ more than your own comfort or you're not gonna be able to follow him. Do you understand that? This is a hard calling. Why do we do that? Because we're not living for this world. There's no children in heaven. There's no marriage in heaven. There's no big bank accounts in heaven. And so we treat all of it as cheap. And so I'm willing to put myself in danger and risk for the cause of Christ. But, but what if I do that, Pastor Ryan? I become a missionary and I move across the world and, and I, I, I preach the gospel to 
to cannibals. What will happen to my wife and kids? Go. Go. Because your wife and kids aren't the purpose of your life. Now, this is not an excuse to not be a faithful husband. This is not an excuse to not be a faithful wife. This is not an excuse to neglect your children or to not be a good employee. That's not what's being said here, but what you need to get is that for true Christians, we count this life as cheap because it's not all there is. This is a, this is a decaying life. This is a, this is a sinful life. This is an unglorified life. And as we go through the Bible, we see that the disciples that followed Jesus, they got this. And we're shocked by the words of our Lord that tells us the conditions of following after him. But then we get to the life of the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 1, as I mentioned earlier, to live as Christ and to die as gain. He says in Philippians 1.21, for to me to live as Christ and to die as gain. But if I am to live on in the flesh, this will remain fruitful labor for me. Listen to this. And I do not which, know which one to choose. To live as Christ, to die as gain. So I got two options. I'm going to live my life for Christ or I'm going to die. And you know which one I'd rather have? Death. Because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But I'm going to choose staying here and to live as Christ. Why? Why, Paul? But I am hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ. That is far much better. Yet to remain on in the flesh is more necessary. Listen to this. For your sake, Church of Philippi. Convinced of this, I know I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith. Can I ask you, is that the purpose of your life? I want to die and be with Christ, but instead I'm going to remain, not for my retirement, not for my kids, not for my boyfriend and girlfriend and my parties and my stuff but for your progress in the faith. I want to be with him. But my living, Paul says, here is going to mean your progress because I'm going to willingly risk it all for your sake. And he says the same thing, not just to the church of Philippi, he says it to the church of Corinth. He also says it to the church of Ephesus. As he's talking to the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, verse four, listen to this. Paul says, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself. Why, Paul? So that I may finish my course and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus Christ to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. Containing the phrase, I do not consider my life of any account or as dear to myself is the Greek adjective, timios. It's contained in that phrase and it means valuable. In other words, I do not count my life as valuable. It's cheap. To accomplish the ministry that God has given you is going to require you to count your life as cheap. Church, do you understand that? That God has a vocation for us all, a calling, that's what that word means. Now listen, he's called you into the auto world. He's called some of you into law and some of you into law enforcement and some of you into academia. Those are all vocations, callings from God. But in those vocations and in all the places God has called you to, he's entrusted to you a ministry to be a witness for Christ. And in those places, it's going to cost you but you're not going to be willing to pay the price if that's what you're living for. It costs you to be a pastor. But I'm not doing this for me. At least my conscience is clear, although that does not justify me. The author of Hebrews gives us a list of people that died in faith, not having seen the promise. 
And there's an interesting verse there. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11, which is the famous hall of faith. You know the chapter well, right? The author of Hebrews goes through this list of Old Testament saints that, that were faithful and endured hardship because of their faith in God. And then the author of Hebrews concludes in chapter 12, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us. But notice in Hebrews chapter 11, notice verse 32. He just gives this list of faithful saints in the Old Testament, gets to verse 32 and just begins to enter into the shotgun round and just name off more faithful people as they come to his mind. He says, and what shall I say then? For time will fail me if I tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, uh, Jephthah, and David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouth of lions, quenched the power uh, of fire, escaped the edge of the sword from weakness, um, were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Verse 35, women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured, not accepting their release so that they might obtain what? A better resurrection. The author of Hebrews here links the suffering of these people, their suffering, their willing suffering, their willingness to embrace danger, their willingness to risk everything for the cause of Christ was all rooted in a better resurrection. It was all rooted in the reality of a future bodily resurrection. Risk for the sake of Christ. Listen to this. It is the lifestyle. Let me say it another way. It is the norm for a true Christian. Now that risk has varying degrees. God calls his saints to risk in varying degrees. You and I don't choose the degree to which we suffer in all things. But we are called to embrace risk for the cause of Christ because we're not just living for this world. Turn back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look more at Paul's risk. Paul's risk. Beginning in verse 30. Why are we in danger every hour? I affirm, brethren, by the boasting which is in you, I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord, I die daily. First, I'd like to just lay before you four truths about the risks that Paul took. Four truths. First of all, notice in verse 30, the word danger. Do you see the word danger? It means risk or peril. It's only used four times in the New Testament. Sometimes it has the idea of a financial risk. Four truths about the risk or peril, or danger that Paul willingly took. First, let's notice the frequency of the risks that he took. Notice verse 31. Brethren, uh, by the boasting in you, which I have in Jesus Christ, I, what? I die daily. I die daily. In Greek, I die daily is actually in the first place of this sentence. In English, it, it's tacked on to the end. But in the original language, it's put in the beginning of the sentence because it gives emphasis. Daily. I die daily. And then notice in verse 30, 31, where it says, I affirm. You see that I affirm? That's a Greek particle that makes the statement a strong affirmative. In other words, this is very, very strong language. And this particular particle is used in classical Greek in association with oaths. This is, uh, this is such strong language, it's, it's like an oath. I, I affirm that I die daily. Now, does he actually die physically? He, he doesn't. He's talking about suffering. This is metaphorical language. But notice verse 30, he says, why am I in danger what? Every Christian, how often are you to embrace danger and risk for the cause of Christ? Daily. Every hour. When is the last time you took a risk for the cause of Christ? Christ? 
Now again, this is Paul's apostolic ministry. We're not called to be apostles. Paul had a particular ministry of suffering that you and I don't have. But he nonetheless is an example for the rest of the church. Not just the frequency of the risks he took. Secondly, look at the aim of the risks he took. The aim. Look at verse 31. I affirm, brethren, by the boasting in you which I have in Christ Jesus, our Lord. The idea of this word, this boasting, is he's talking about them. Just like we noted when he talked to the, church, the Ephesian elders in Acts chapter 20, this idea of boasting is he's, he's saying, look at you. The church of Corinth was started by the apostle Paul because of his willingness to embrace danger and take risks. Why was he doing this? You see, because what was more important to Paul wasn't his earthly comfort. It was that others would know Christ. That was so much more important to him than his own comfort and pleasure that he deliberately places himself in danger and at risk for the sake of others. Thirdly, let's look at the types of risk Paul took. Notice in the text, he then tells us one of the ways he took risks. Look at verse 32. If from human motives I fought with wild beefs, I keep saying beefs, he didn't fight beefs, he fought beasts. <laughs> if from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus. Now this is metaphorical language to describe false teachers in Ephesus. In this passage, Paul describes a riot that erupted because of false teachers in Ephesus. And he calls them wild beasts. Now, this is common Old Testament language. In the Old Testament, enemies of God are commonly referred to as beasts. Now, why? Because people that are not spirit-filled people, people that don't have the spiritual life of God in them, those people, they're just reacting in the flesh. Alice and I have two cats. We love our cats, Hook and Lily. And sometimes I like to think that Hook and Lily really love me. But the reality is Hook and Lily just react mostly just in the flesh. Lily comes and cuddles me or Hook purrs because I'm home. But he really just wants food. <laughs> he, he's a wild beast. And, and beasts just react in their flesh. And this is what enemies of God do. Psalm 22 verses 12 through 13 says, many bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They open wide their mouth at me and a raving and roaring as a lion. Psalm 35, 17, how long, O Lord, will you look on? Rescue my soul from their ravages, my only life from the lions. Enemies of God are described in the Bible as, as unreasoning, unspiritual beasts. So Paul here takes up that Old Testament language and he says in verse 31 or verse 32 that I didn't do this from human motives. I, meaning from earthly motives to get praise in this life, to get comfort in this life. That's not why I fought with the, fi the false teachers in Ephesus. And you can go back and read Acts 19 and Paul chronicles that account. And what happens is, is that he disrupts the temple worship of the false god Artemis and the result is, is it sparks an enormous riot in Ephesus. Paul literally went into that city and he fought the false teachers by giving them the truth. And what was the, what happened? <laughs> Nothing pleasant. Why would Paul do that? You ever wanted to share the gospel with someone at your work that held to another religion, but you knew that it would cost you something for doing it? Embrace that danger. Embrace that risk. Because this life isn't what we're living for. We're living for the next. Paul then also, not just here, but in 2 Corinthians, he gives a whole list of other dangers he put himself in. Not just confronting false teachers. Because listen, if you go out there and you take the truth of God's world to a dark 
uh, world, the truth of God's word to a dark world and you begin to combat false thinking, guess what's going to happen to you? You're going to get pushback. But that's not the only danger that Paul embraced. For the sake of the gospel, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul actually uses the same uh, uh, word or the noun form of the word. This is a verb form for the word danger. He uses the noun form to describe the suffering he endured at other times. In 2 Corinthians 11, 23 through 29, he says this, three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and day I have spent in the deep. I mean, just think about that. Have you ever been in the middle of the ocean or the sea of Galilee for a night and a day for the sake of the gospel? Have you ever been shipwrecked, beaten with rods, stoned? I've been on frequent journeys in danger. Same, this is the noun form. In dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers from the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me and concern for all the churches. Who is weak without my being weak? Who is led into sin without my intense concern? Listen, as you read through the life of the apostle Paul, he, he, he just seems like he is a glutton for punishment. But he's not. You see, Paul's figured something out that we've forgotten. And that's that the resurrection is what we should be living for. And so he treats this life as a very small thing. Look again at the text. What was his motivation? His motivation for the risks he took. He took. Notice verse 32 again. If from human motives I fought with wild beasts at Eph- Ephesus beasts, <laughs> what does it profit me? If the dead are not raised, what, what's the profit? What's the gain? <laughs> Just think about this. The world thinks you are crazy for being a Christian. Do you know why the world thinks you're crazy for being a Christian? Because they don't think there's any profit in it. And you know why they don't think there's any profit in it? Because they're only looking for profit in this life. So if you're only looking to be a Christian for what you get out of it in this life, I have news for you. You're going to be let down. But we're not in it for what we get from this life. Notice what Paul says. What does it profit to me? And then he says, if the dead are not raised... The prophet is, I'm going to be with him. And I just want to stand before him and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. And I want to be in my resurrected body where every tear will be wiped and there will be no more pain, no death, no decay. That's what I'm living for, Paul says. That's the purpose of my life. And he says, and if that weren't the case, Look what he says. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. You know why we don't just party? Because I'm not trying to get all the pleasure I could get out of this life because this life isn't all there is. That's his whole point here. But what's interesting is he quotes, and we're gonna have to end here for the sake of time. He quotes Isaiah 22, verse 13. Do you see if you have the NAS translation? It'll be in all caps. Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Now, every time you see an Old Testament quote in the New Testament, it's helpful to go back into the Old Testament to get the context of that quote because it's not just the individual words that are imported in, it's the context that's imported in. So let's turn together to Isaiah chapter 22. 
And Isaiah, chapter 22. The Lord pronounces judgment on Jerusalem. Let's pick it up in verse 12. Therefore, in that day, the Lord God of hosts called you to weeping and to wailing, to shaving the head and to wearing sackcloth. Now this is a, way that you would outwardly express remorse over sin and repentance if you were an Old Testament Jew. Because of the judgment that he had just pronounced on his people, he was calling them to repentance. When God points out your sinfulness, the response that he's asking for is repentance. A contrite heart he will not despise. And that repentance was demonstrated in weeping and wailing. and the sh- It was this, have mercy on me, God. Have mercy on me, God. And what did Israel do? Well, if we're going to be judged, let's get drunk. Look at verse 13. Instead, There is gaiety and gladness, killing of cattle and slaughtering of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Wine, here it is, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we. (laughs) I'm going to hell anyway, let's party. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that from unbelievers. No. Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. You see, your life is not going to be weighed in the balances when you die. God has already declared you guilty. Jesus says in John chapter 3, verse 17 and 18, that Jesus came to seek and save the lost because the world is already judged. We think we're going to live our life, and at the end of our life, our, our good deeds are going to be put on one side of the scale, and our bad deeds on the other side of the scale. And if our good deeds outweigh the bad deeds, we're going to get into heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God has already declared every human outside of Jesus Christ judged. Jesus says in John chapter 3 verses 17 and 18, he has judged you already. And so people say, well, if I'm already judged, let's eat and drink for tomorrow I die. But the gospel is this. No. Jesus Christ is offering you forgiveness. Jesus Christ is offering you forgiveness eternal life. He's offering you spiritual life. Come to him in faith and he will put his spirit within you. He will give you spiritual life. You will have eternal life and come alive to God and you will be heading for glorification for this resurrected body that Paul's talking about in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul uses or quotes Isaiah 22:13. Because what Paul's argument is, is this. You know what? I would have done the same thing that the Jews did in Isaiah 22 if I had not known that this life is not all there is. And so I don't just eat, drink, for tomorrow I die. I give my life to serve Christ. For tomorrow I die and the day after I rise again. Metaphorically speaking. Did you know that everyone will be raised from the dead? Every single human being that has ever lived will have a bodily resurrection. Christians and unchristians. Jesus says in John 5, 26 through 29, for just as the father has life in himself, even so he gave life to the son also to have life in himself and he gave him authority to execute judgment 
because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for the hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth and those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who commit evil deeds, listen to this, to a resurrection of judgment. In John chapter five, Jesus says that every human being will be physically resurrected. Christians to a resurrection of life, that is to glorification. Unchristians to a resurrection of judgment. Let's look at those both briefly as we close. Revelation chapter 20. In Revelation chapter 20, we come to what is the great white throne of judgment. And in Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 11, we read, then I saw the white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. This is the end of the age when unbelievers are resurrected. They're brought up from Sheol, they're brought up from Hades and they're brought before the judgment seat of Christ. This is not a Bema seat judgment. This is not a judgment of rewards. This is a judgment of condemnation. They're physically resurrected. And he says, verse 12, and I saw the dead, the great and small, standing before the throne. And the books were opened and another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up their dead, which were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead, which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. This is, Gehenna, this is the the final resting place of all unbelievers. Eternal conscious torment, the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he is thrown into the lake of fire. Every human being that is not a Christian will be bodily resurrected and eternally cast into conscious torment. And what's that torment? Well, it's described as a lake of fire. Understand this, hell is bodily. And so is heaven. God has not created the human race to not be eternal. Do you know that? We are created in his image. But the reason we die is because the punishment for sin is death. But he will resurrect everyone and the Christians a resurrection of life and unchristians to the resurrection of hell the resurrection of the believer is theologically called glorification upon death your soul is separated from your body that's the intermediate state but then your body will be resurrected and rejoined to your soul And at that moment, that's called glorification. So how do you know if you're going to be glorified? How do you know if you're going to be caught up with Christ or if you're going to be taken before the great white throne of judgment? How do you know? Turn to Romans 8. The answer to know if you're going to be glorified is whether or not you're justified. Look at Romans 8, 29 and 30. This is called famously the golden chain of salvation. Romans 8, 29 For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son and that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And to those whom he predestined, he also called. And to those who he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also what? Now what's interesting is that word glorified is in past tense, meaning it's already occurred. It's actually occurred in the past and has present effects in the, in the present. Now, but here's just what I want you to see. Don't get caught up with all the other words, predestination and all that. I just want you to see, grammatically speaking, the Greek conjunction and. You see the word and, how it's used there? If you were just to get out a pen and just circle in verses 29 and 30, all the times you see the word and, 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 and. 
Grammatically speaking, that conjunction inseparably links the different truths. So you can work backward to find out if you're glorified. So you start in verse 30, glorified, go back, and you know you're glorified if you're what? And you know you're justified because you're called, and you know you're called because you're predestined. But what I want to point out is the word justified. The word justified is a legal term. It, it means that God declares you not guilty. The Bible says that God created us to have a relationship with God. But rather than walk with God and obey God and submit to God, we rebelled against God. How do we know we rebelled against God? Because the law of God, the Ten Commandments, shows us that we have rebelled against him. We've broken his law. And James says that if we've broken one point of the law, we've broken the whole law. And the punishment for breaking God's law and breaking fellowship with him, the punishment is death. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that who shall ever believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. God in his great mercy and love then sent his son Jesus Christ into the world. And Christ came down out of heaven. He came into the world to go to the cross. And upon the cross, he took upon himself the judgment that you and I deserve because of our sin. And when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, that judgment that you deserve all falls on Jesus and not on you. But Jesus did not just go to the cross. When he died, he was buried. And three days later, he rose again. And when he rose from the grave, he proved who he was and he conquered death forever. And so that all those who place their faith in Christ, not only did he absorb the wrath of God for us, but he accomplished resurrection for us so all those in him will also be resurrected. When you place your faith in Jesus Christ, the Father declares you not guilty. He declares you justified. And when we know that our sins are forgiven, we begin to live differently because he has placed our, his spirit within us and we now know that just as Christ conquered the grave, we too in him will conquer the grave. This world is not our home. The question is, are you holding on to this life so tightly that you're not embracing any risk or danger for the cause of Christ? You see, your theology of resurrection will not be shown in what you say. Your theology of resurrection will be shown in how you live. Paul really believed that he was going to be resurrected. And that belief led him to treat this life as cheap. How about you? Are you living for this world only? Or are you longing for the resurrection that those have, that we have in Christ? I hope it's the latter. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this poignant reminder the reminder that this life is not all there is. Lord, as a church, we are convicted by this passage and want to ask the question, what can we do? What are you calling us to do? And would you so work in us and among us that we would not let the risk or the danger keep us from doing what you're calling us to do. But would we embrace it, knowing that this life is not all there is? God, we ask that you would give us an eternal perspective. And we thank you for this day as we look again at the resurrection of our Lord and our resurrection, all those who are in him. Thank you for giving us the promise of resurrection. And thank you for giving us a foretaste of it in the life of your son.
In Jesus' name, amen.